Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the Jerusalem incident, Acts chapter 21 and 22. Chapter 21 begins, verse 1, when we had parted from them, uh, the them is the old, the Ephesian elders, they had gathered with Paul at Miletus, um, and they they had spent some time at Miletus with him, saying goodbye, um, and now they depart and had set sail. We ran a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. So notice Rhodes, that's the island off the coast of Anatolia, uh, Patera, and having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. They're headed back, back to Judea. Verse 3, when we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, that's one of the Phoenician cities, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. Verse 4, after looking up the disciples, these are the disciples there in Tyre, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. We've already had that theme in the previous chapter. (laughs) Paul's been warned. The warnings are going to escalate. If you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be arrested. Verse 5, when our days there were ended, We left and started on our journey while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach, that's the beach to the south, presumably to the south of Tyre, and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home again. So notice we're continuing, um, even though you can walk the rest of the way, they're continuing by ship. Verse 7 When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemaeus. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. Ptolemais is the next city down. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist. And you say, which Philip is this? Well, he was one of the seven. The seven refer to the seven deacons that were chosen uh, back in Acts chapter 6. Uh, he was one of those seven. We stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. Uh, Paul's been getting lots of prophecies. He's going to get another one in just a minute. Verse 10, as we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus. Now, we've seen Agabus back in Acts chapter 11. I'm I'm assuming it's the same person, Uh, came down from Judea. Judea is the province in which Jerusalem is is located. Um, Verse 11, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at, at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So not only is Paul getting a prophecy, he, uh, a prophecy, he's getting a uh, a very visual object lesson to go with it. Verse twelve: When we had heard this, we, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. God's been saying, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be arrested. You're going to be bound. Verse twelve: Then Paul answered. What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul has received these prophecies. He's received them as being true and accurate, and he's going anyway, even though it means his arrest and maybe even his death. Verse 14, and since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, notice the conclusion they come to, the will of the Lord be done. Um, You see, God has been prophesying what's going to take place, but that's okay because God has a bigger plan in action. Verse 15, after these days, we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. So now they're finally coming to Jerusalem. Verse 16, some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, uh, taking us to Mnason of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing, with whom we were to lodge. Notice he's going to be staying with somebody who's from out of the area, um, someone from Cyprus. Uh, Verse 17, after we had arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Now, 
I want you to see what's going on, and I'm borrowing this chart from Vernon Robbins. I uh, did an excellent work here. Uh, we'd had the Jerusalem Council back in Acts chapter 15, and then uh, the second missionary journey began, and we had seen uh, Paul traveling to different locations throughout uh, Anatolia and on into uh, Macedonia, and there he was arrested and imprisoned. Uh, next, we saw him come to Athens, and he gives this speech in Athens it's at the Areopagus, and then there's an, he comes to Corinth, and at Corinth there's a, uh, a legal charge brought against uh, Paul. Um, he is try- he is uh, brought into court into the court of Gallio, the Roman proconsul, uh, and then he leaves there and he goes and does more traveling. Uh, the pivotal point in this whole section uh, is where the gospel is being spread, especially uh, leaving Corinth and now going to uh, in and around Ephesus, and the gospel is spread all throughout that area. Next, we have a, a second assembly. This time, it is, instead of a, um, in front of a proconsul, it's more of a riot, but it's at the theater in Ephesus, and again, there's more travel after that. We see another speech, this time at Miletus, where Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders who have gathered there. Next, there is more travel and a prophecy of imprisonment, a prophecy of, of how Paul is going to be bound. We've been looking at that. And finally, we come full circle where Paul comes back to Jerusalem and he reports to those same Jerusalem leaders who had been there at the Jerusalem Council. So there's a whole section here that's in parallel. Verse 18, And the following day, Paul went in with us, notice Luke is there too, uh, he went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Now, um, in, in back in Acts 15, we had seen James and Peter uh, and others and perhaps apostles. Uh, the other apostles are not mentioned. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're there, but notice it's James and the elders who are described as being present. It might be that by now, some of the apostles have started going to other locations and leaving Jerusalem and now taking the gospel to other parts of the world. Tradition has it that the apostles ended up uh, giving their lives and, and, um, and eventually being martyred in all sorts of places around the ancient world. Um, and, and that might have already started by now. Uh, but James is there. Now, this is James. Sounds like James, the Lord's brother, because remember, James, the brother of John, had already been put to death back in Acts chapter 12. Uh, and notice the church is no longer being uh, led by by apostles, now it's the elders who were present. Well, after he had greeted them, he began to relate uh, one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. After all, Paul has, yes, he ministers to Jews, but he's, his main ministry has been to the Gentiles. Verse 20, and when they heard it, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. The church which had dwindled for a time because of persecution, has now grown back to thousands. Notice how many thousands there are among the Jews who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law, after all they're Jewish. And they have been told about you, that you were teaching all the Jews who were among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. Now that's not true. Paul has not been telling Jewish people not to do that. He has been telling Gentiles they don't have to keep the law in order to be justified. They don't have to be circumcised. Uh, But he has not been telling Jewish parents, don't circumcise your children. That would, would have been unthinkable to Paul. Verse 22, what then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. There's a problem approaching, and it's Paul, and some of the false things that have been said about him. Verse 23, therefore, do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. That was a sort of a Jewish thing, a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. And by the way, Paul was Jewish, so yes, he did walk according to the law. Uh, he um, he he uh, didn't try to undo circumcision. He kept the law. He kept basically, um, you know, he he was a Jewish person and he lived that way. Verse twenty five. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, 
We wrote, having decided they should uh, notice the, the requirements for Gentiles, abstain from, uh, abstain from meat sacrificed to idols. Not that meat is bad meat, but that, that could cause an issue. Um, and from blood, they should be drinking blood. That's just sort of gross anyway. Uh, and from what is strangled and from fornication. So basic laws for Gentiles, not all the Jewish laws. They weren't telling uh, Gentiles to be circumcised or, or to do this, that, or the other. But here were some of the things that they wanted the Gentiles to do, the Gentile Christians, and the Gentiles had been doing those things. Verse 26, then Paul took the men. And the next day, purifying himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Apparently, there was a whole process that uh, they had to check in with the temple authorities. And, And they do this as good Jewish observers would do. Now, notice in this model of Jerusalem, this is a model that's actually in Jerusalem, but it's a model of the way Jerusalem looked in the first century. And you have the, the temple itself in the middle, and then you have some large courts around it. I'm not going to go into detail on those. But notice I've pointed to the dividing wall. Outside that wall, the, it was still the temple complex, but outside that wall was known uh, as the the court of the Gentiles. And Gentiles were allowed, they had to be respectful, but they were permitted into that outer court. But past that wall, there were signs at each entrance at that low wall. It's about four or five feet tall. Um, And we found some of the signs um, uh, in and around the Temple Mount. And the sign said, no Gentile passed this point upon pain of death. And so um, it was okay for Gentiles to be in the outer court but not in those inner courts. Uh, for example, when you first went in, you'd find yourself in the court of the women, and uh, the women would be there, and Jewish men, uh, but only Jewish people. No Gentiles allowed past that dividing wall. All right, uh, that, that's setting up what's going to be the issue now. Verse 27, when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, these are Jews who had run into Paul when he was in Asia, when he was uh, spreading the gospel among the Gentiles, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. Now, Paul did not preach against the place. He didn't preach against the law. He didn't preach against Jewish people. But he did give the gospel to Gentiles. Notice they continue. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Now, Paul had not done that. Where did they get this idea from? Verse 21, for they had previously seen Trophimus. Trophimus apparently was a Gentile. Uh, The Ephesian in the city with him, he was a Gentile convert. And they supposed, incorrectly as it turns out, they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. He had not. It's possible that Trophimus had been in the court of the Gentiles. I I can't can't say about that. He had been in association with Paul in Jerusalem, but they're jumping to a conclusion. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple. Now, he wasn't in the, in the, in the temple proper. Only priests went into that. But he was in one of these inner courts. You're looking at the court of the woman uh, in, in the foreground. And they dragged him out of that area. That would have been called the temple. And immediately the doors were shut. They want to make sure that all Gentiles are out. Verse 31, while they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. Now, notice this picture of, of the temple complex. Over to, on the right, there is a uh, four-towered complex. You see that? Uh, that was known as the Fortress Antonia. And the cohort, the Roman cohort, by the way, the, our, um, our, our Greek text doesn't say it was a Roman cohort, just as the cohort. Uh, But that's probably referring to the Roman troops that were stationed there in Fortress Antonia. Uh, They overlooked the temple grounds. And and word comes to the commander that there's a riot going on. 
Verse 32, at once he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. There was a staircase going from the fortress down into the temple complex. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Apparently they were in the process of putting him to death, even though they did not have legal authority to, to, to put somebody to death. Verse 33, then the commander came up and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And he began asking who he was and what he had done. Um, at the center of all this riot is this, this person, Paul. And so he, he figures, well, he must have instigated it. So he arrests him. Why did you arrest him? Because, because he's in the middle of it all. Well, well, wait a minute, they're, they're attacking him. Well, uh, you'll figure that out later on. Verse 34, but among the crowds, some were shouting one thing and some another. And when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. So Paul's going to be taken up to the fortress Antonia, also known as the barracks. Verse 35, when he got to the stairs leading up to the fortress, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. Notice the, the fighting is continuing. They are doing a physical extraction. Verse 36, for the multitude of the people kept following them, shouting, away with him. Verse 37, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? <laughs> if that's the case, then you're not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. Uh, that's not you. Um, notice uh, Paul addresses him, and this conversation takes place in Greek you say, well, how would a Roman know Greek? Because Greek was the common language among all the Gentiles. Verse 39, but Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus. Tarsus is in, in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. In Cilicia, that's, that's one of the provinces there. A citizen of no insignificant city. And I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. The thinking here, maybe, is that Paul might be able to de-escalate the situation. Paul's thinking is that he might get a chance to give the gospel. Verse 40, when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hand, and when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect. You see, he had spoken to the to the Roman commander in Greek, but now he speaks to them in Hebrew. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And we're on into chapter 22. Verse 2, And when they heard that he was addressing them in Hebrew, in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, and now we're going to have Paul's, uh, it's going to be a, a speech, a sermon, a report. Uh, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. That's why he's able to speak Hebrew. Uh, educated under Gamaliel. Gamaliel had been uh, a very well-known, in fact, we know him even from regular Jewish sources, uh, a, a rabbi of the Pharisees. And we, we saw Gamaliel in his interaction with the, with the Sanhedrin back in Acts chapter 5. Uh, here we find out that Paul had been educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. Where they are today, Paul was back at the beginning of his Christian experience. Verse 4, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. After all, he had been in their employment. From them, I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus. He had run out of people to persecute in Jerusalem, so he had taken off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. Verse 6, But it happened that as I was on my way, approaching Damascus, about noontime, a very bright light, now it's already bright at noon, <laughs> but a brighter light than whatever was at noon, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, after all, that was, his, that was his Hebrew name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 8, And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, 
the Nazarene whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. Um, Now, it's interesting. Um, We've had an account of Paul that was told by Luke in Acts chapter 9. We're going to have another account when we get to chapter 26 of Paul telling his story again. And what we'll do when we get there, we'll compare all three accounts and see some of the differences, some of the similarities, But, you know, every time you tell a story, you have a tendency to tell it slightly differently. And that's what's taking place here. We're going to see a few minor differences in the way the story is told. Verse 10, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into into Damascus. Paul had been struck blind. Verse 12, a certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the, and notice this this devoutness being mentioned again. Uh, Paul had been been devout. Ananias was devout, uh, devout by the standards of the law, not just by Christian standards, and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, Receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him. And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness. Remember what the key word in the book of Acts is? There it is. You will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. Verse 17, it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple. Now notice, Paul is leaving out some things that took place. He's, he's giving a, a abbreviated uh, report, but now he describes coming back to Jerusalem when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance, and I saw him saying to me, that is Jesus, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. Verse 19, and I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in me, in, in you. I, they're going to listen to me because I was the chief persecutor. Verse 20, and when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. Uh, remember that was described back in Acts chapter 7. Verse 21, and he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. <laughs> now, at that point, there's going to be an interruption. Everything that Paul has said up to this point, the Jews that are gathered have no problem listening to. But maybe a few things make them a little bit uncomfortable. But so far, they have held their peace until until they heard this instruction that Paul has been given from Jesus, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And they listened to him up to the statement. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. The very idea of any Jewish person going to the Gentiles, that that was anathema to their ears. Verse 23, as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging. The Romans had this feeling, if if, uh, you want to question somebody, beat them up, and then they'll be more pliable to your questioning. And so that's what they're going to do, uh, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. After all, he hadn't understood a word that had been said. It was in Hebrew. He doesn't speak Hebrew. Paul speaks Hebrew. The other Jewish people that were there had spoken Hebrew, but this Roman centurion doesn't know the language. Verse 25, but when they stretched him out with thongs, they've tied him down, they're they're ready to start and let the beatings begin. Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Because Paul, 
is a Roman citizen. We, we've read about that back in, in Acts chapter 16. Even though he's Jewish, he is a Roman citizen. Verse 26, when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, oh, what are you about to do? This man is a Roman. Now, a centurion, remember, that's like a, like a sergeant. Uh, it's over 100 uh, soldiers. The commander would be in charge of the entire um, regiment, legion, whatever, whatever we call it. Uh, but he reports to the commander uh, that this man's a Roman. Verse 27, the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. You see, it was illegal to beat a Roman citizen. In fact, it was illegal to, to chain a Roman citizen unless he had been um, uh, examined by proper Roman authorities. And the commander of a legion is not a proper Roman authority. He can, he can keep the peace, but Roman citizenship made someone sacrosanct. Verse 28, the commander answered, I acquired the citizenship with a large sum of money. Now, later on, that's going to be outlawed. That, uh, um, he had done this earlier, but that's, that's about to be um, a, th a thing of the past. Uh, but apparently, he had paid some money and somehow gotten his citizenship. And Paul said, but I was actually born a citizen. Um, and so Paul had, now, how did Paul's uh, family become a citizen? We don't know. There's all sorts of possibilities. Uh, a a slave who had been freed acquired sort of a second-class citizenship, and then any children they had after that could also be Roman citizens. So maybe that's maybe that's the case. Maybe there had been uh, a Jewish slave in Paul's uh, uh, background in his ancestry, or perhaps some other way. We simply don't know the circumstances. Verse 20, 29, Therefore those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him, and the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put him in chains. You know, that, that, like I said, that was, that was serious business. Verse 30, but on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. They're going to have a trial. And pausing here is almost like a cliffhanger, but that's where the chapter ends. So we're going to pause here, and we'll pick up in the next chapter with a still another trial, a trial before Jewish authorities uh, there in Jerusalem.